Hey, hey, Walter, what's happening, man? How are you? I'm doing well, brother. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for being here again. You know, it's been a little while since the last time we were able to talk to the audience, and I'm really thrilled. We've come up with what I think is a really cool project to utilize your skills. Um, now, for all of you, you know, we've talked about it. Walter is a survival expert, a primitive skills instructor. He designs knives for condor, tool, and knife. Well, now we get to take all of this, put it together, and apply it to some good practical use. I, I think you got something in store for us. What do you think, Walter? Yes. Actually, uh, what we're going to do is to uh, review some very important basic survival concepts, such as the five C's. I always say that there's not a perfect kit. So we go over these five C's to be able to develop in the wilderness in a better way, right? So uh, let's make a review about, really quick about it. So we have a cutting tool, container, cordage, cover. And we will focus in this uh, episode on combustion tool. So what I'm going to do, I'm going out to the wilderness and I will show you some skills for combustion tool in my environment. And then I will let Eric, you, my friend, and Joe to perform on their own. Well, this is going to be fun. So yeah, the, the premise of this is really to take these fundamentals and now bring them out into practice. And it doesn't matter what environment, and for the audience, they're about to see what we're getting into. It doesn't matter what the environment, the principles are sound, they are applicable no matter where you are in the world. Yes, it might change, you know, you might have to adapt, you might have to tweak things one way or another, but the core principles are the core principles, and that's exactly what we're here to talk about today. So. Joe from Survival Attitude and I, we're going to get out there and we're really going to put this stuff into practice. I'm pretty excited to see how we do. Yeah, we're going to train and we're going to have some fun also at the same time. Well, I can't wait. So at this point, well, Walter, I think you got some field time coming up. What do you say? I'm excited about it. I'm going to be out showing you some of the skill for combustion tool. Let's get to it. Have fun out there. Okay. All right. I always talk about there's not such thing as a perfect survival kit. So uh, at the Pathfinder School, I learned the concept of the five C's, which is uh, a minimum of element you will carry all the time when you are in the wilderness. Um, so briefly, a container, hopefully a metal one, a cutting tool, covered, cordage that you can carry like this or uh, if you have the, the Selgram knife or the Toki knife you will see three straps where you can store cordage like this and combustion tool and this one will be our focus today okay Eric Joe and all our fans and followers I will share with you my fire philosophy I base my fire philosophy on three main concepts. The first one is preparation, the second one is safety, and the third one is sustain. Each one of, of these concepts has a meaning, all right? First one, preparation, um, for make it easy for you to understand, we will see two different scenarios. First one, speed, and the second one, slow. So speed is when you are prepared, when you are carrying some gear, such as a fire kit to make your fire easy. And the second one, the second scenario, slow one, is when you are facing an extreme situation where you are not prepared and you need to, to collect from the, uh, from the wilderness what you need to make fire. And that also means you will, be, uh, you will need to be skilled on primitive fire or semi-primitive fire, right? Safety, also split in two. Safety when you ignite your fire and safety when you turn off your fire because we don't cause any forest fire. And the third one, sustain. I mean with this that anyone is able to get sparks and make a, and get a flame. But what we need is to have a sustainable fire, a fire that will help us to boil our water, to cook, to build something, to, um, to feel more comfortable, 
to feel uh, warm, uh, everything, all right? I, we already talked about the importance of fire. So remember, my philosophy, three steps. And now, concept number one, preparation. To be prepared and not need to face the second scenario, which is a slow scenario, facing an extreme situation and having to collect all the materials to build your fire in a primitive way, you'll be carrying fire resources, fire material, fire ignition materials. Combustion tool, remember? We are talking about combustion tools. So this is, uh, is my fire kit. I like to carry my fire kit in a waterproof box like this one, you see? this one and always carry at least uh, two which means one principle and one backup way to ignite your fire here for instance you have a magnifying glass the most <laughs> uh, easy one a lighter okay you get flames instantly quickly Remember, speed. This is a Pathfinder uh, clean and steel set for percussion fire. In my pocket, I always have my ferro rod. And also, I like to carry different kind of uh, accessories like these fire pads. Really easy to build. These are great tinder material. Here we have some matches. The problem with matches, they are weak. They can break really easily, especially if you are under extreme condition, like coal, for instance. Your moves turn slow and less skilled. Here, some more tinder material to make charcoal, my fire kit, and some other accessories or tinder. Here I have another <laughs> flint and steel set. It's a nice gift from my friend Keith Sires. Made of myself in boot camp for Alone Season 7. It's really cool. He made this himself from a deer skin. And it's the same concept. It's a high carbon steel and you get sparks with it. You see? Another one, this is uh, another kind of ferro rod. It's a tool, the name is Sharp and Spark. So here you can have a ferro rod. Also, here, a knife uh, sharpener. And this is the scrapper, right? Sharp and Spark. Thanks to my friend from Sharp and Char Char Spark for sending me this. And um, one of my designs was born originally in 2018, but this is the new Selgnam. The sheath comes with a 1095 striker, so you can make also a flint and steel technique and get a spark from it. Also in the sheath you can carry a ferro rod such as this Exotac ferro rod and in the pocket you also have a lighter and this is Amadou which is another fire resource that you collect from uh, that you harvest from uh, fungus if you collect the right one you can get this Amadou also in this pocket you can carry a small box with charcoal so, remember, when it's about fire, the first concept of my philosophy is preparation. Carry the material all the time. You need to ignite fire really quickly. Otherwise, you need to be really skilled. Right? But we will talk about the second scenario, on a slow scenario facing an uh, extreme situation in another video. Right? So, all right, Walter, thank you very much for that introduction. Everybody, Joe from Eric. Survival Attitude. What's happening, man? How are you, Eric? Uh, I'm great. So, um, well, as Walter mentioned, you know, the five C's, 
one of the very, very important of the five C's, combustion. Joe and I are out here in this beautiful wilderness morning just to enjoy the outdoors and to really now talk about combustion from our standpoint. So, Joe, I think we're in a slightly different environment from Walter there, huh? <laughs> It was worth the 15 hour drive this morning, Eric. <laughs> yeah, d deep, deep Canadian exactly. wilderness, yeah. <laughs> I saw a Sasquatch right over there. <laughs> I think he was bleeding out. We saw some blood trail, someone I, got him. I did, I did, <laughs> wounded, wounded. But uh, yeah, so anyway, I mean, and, and to, uh, you know, I guess feed into what Walter's been talking about, you know, um, everything from your preparation to your safety and sustaining, it's gonna matter, um, you know, not just uh, in, in, in a warmer environment, but really, especially in a colder environment. And I think the interesting thing with this whole sort of scenario is, we see Walter in the warmer, um, you know, sandy, palm style areas, um, but in our environment, you know, snowy, uh, woodlands, tree cover, uh, pines, it doesn't matter where you are, proper survival techniques are sort of, it's, it's irrelevant in a way to your environment, but it's how you apply it. It's the theory's the same, but we're going to apply it a little bit different here. Yeah, the human body needs those certain aspects to survive no matter where you are, whether it's, you know, food, fire, water, shelter. Um, it's all part of it. Again, you know, from Walter's warmer environment to here in a, in a blistering 16 degree uh, woodland setting, we really need to get, you know, that fire going. It's, it's warmth, whether you're, because don't forget, even in a tropical environment, it could get really cold at night, that if it's salt air for, for signaling, for food, for safety. You got it. Right? So you got those it. principles are the same. They are exactly the same. So, um, well, with that, let's transition. Walter showed us his fire kit. Um, now, one of his uh, main principles being the preparation piece. We've come out here prepared. We've thought about our kit. We've thought about our environment. And we've assembled some, uh, you know, fire making supplies and tools to help us with this. And the tools in this application, I think, are going to be pretty critical. So, mm -hmm. uh, with that, let's get into it. All right, so here's what I assembled today for fire kit. Sure, we got. So first, before we get into anything, we need you need a way to spark combustion, and you really can't even take any steps further to ignite anything. We should have got proper fire ignition tools, and here I have really just two. So going modern, got just a basic uh, ferro rod. Okay, I like this one here. He's a cheap like eight bucks. I put little grips on them, but I love the uh, carbide striker. It's never let me down. I like it sealed and contained, so moisture and elements don't end up corroding any of the actual ferro, ferrocium, or the uh, uh, carbide tip. Here, I've had this for a very, very long time. I have a piece of uh, flint. I have some char cloth. A couple pieces, probably like six pieces. And I've got my old trusty carbide striker. I always carry a little bit of my own homemade uh, Maya dust from Fatwood. I've got some small um, fuzz, but I also have a little bit larger, just so it sustains a little bit longer before you get your secondary ignition going. So can't live without that. And I do bring this. Multi-purpose, throw in your boots, the waterproof, hands if they're dry, but also if you have some wet leaves or whatever, you know, ignition material, a little bit damp, a little bit of this rubbing on it, it really helps with the ignition. So for me, I really strike the balance between my sort of call it like outdoor survival fire kit and my hiking, camping, and backpacking kit. To me, they're two different things, and the kit that I brought today is kind of a combination of both. Now, the first thing you'll see is I did put this in a waterproof bag. Not 100% waterproof, but very water resistant. I think if you submerge this long enough, you may have a problem, but for a day like today, it's perfect. And I did this pretty much because of Walter's teaching. If you look at one of his first points, he did have his fire kit in a waterproof container. That could be a big deal. Now, I don't usually think of that, but you know, trying to advance and grow grow and gain and get a little bit smarter. I thought it was a good idea. So you'll see here, just a waterproof case. Now it is a dry bag style, Velcro shut. And as I get in here, we'll go through the contents. 
So as I mentioned, I do have my hiking, camping, and backpacking kit. As you can see, very compact and very lightweight. To me, that's a big deal. But again, it's not necessarily waterproof, with the one example being that I do have this lighter. So this has a gasket, keeps it nice and potentially dry. You can see it is gasketed on the inside. And I refill this all the time. It is a nice butane torch lighter. You gotta be a little careful with these. Sometimes it's hard to get them lit if you have to keep it in your pocket when it's really cold. I'm gonna do that right now. Now I have a nice little tinder set here. This is called Fiber Light. I've looked at this in the past. It's very fluffy and it's got a little bit of uh, wax impregnation in it. Um, it's very natural, so if you're cooking, this is good stuff. It lights very easy. Again, nice, compact, good and fluffy for your tinder source. Here I have a ferro rod. I'll always have a knife with a good 90 degree spine, which will allow me to strike this, so nice half inch ferro rod. And one thing that a lot of people don't always think of, but it's very helpful, a small pocket bellows. Sometimes you need a little extra oxygen, a little extra air into your fire to really get it ripping, and especially if you want to sustain. Again, going to one of Walter's principles, it's one thing to get prepared, but it's another to sustain. And if you want to get that fire good and strong, sometimes you need a little extra air. Now trying to get a little bit further with some of the different tinder sources, I have a couple of different materials here. Just like Joe, I actually did also bring some char cloth. It's nice when you make it up ahead of time, but if you have to, you can make it on site once you have your fire going. Now obviously char cloth is a tinder, so having some with you to start your fire is a big deal. We're gonna actually make a little bit more today. And to do so, I have a special tin that I use to make the char cloth, so I did bring that as part of my fire kit. An ignition source, here I have some waterproof matches. I have put these in a little self-made container, just a little carbon fiber tube with some waterproof plugs on the ends and a number of matches. Then on the bottom, I actually put a little st striking pad so uh, hopefully you can get these lit if you need them. Again, back to Walter's point, matches can be tough so I wouldn't fully rely on them but it's good to have them with you. Now in terms of another tinder source, this is a little bit different. Um, these here are trioxane. You actually get these with like MREs and military style meals. Uh, these can burn for a good long time. So they're a little harder to get fired up in the first place, but once you do, these do sustain. You could actually cook a whole meal with them and it gives you a good long burn. So if you're struggling to get a fire started, crush one of these up, spark it with your ferro rod, get this thing lit and it can really help you get a sustainable fire. And finally, there's no denying good fat wood is an excellent tinder source. So whether you split this down into some kindling, which it's almost that size, but I would split this down a little bit further, or you get some nice shavings, this is a real great way to get your fire started. I think we'll probably use these today. So here we have a couple of knives. These are the Condor tool and knife, Selknam, designed by Walter Matthews. So Walter, thank you very much. These are Walter's personal blades. Uh, he sent them to me so that we could use them for this video. This one here being his original prototype, which he has autographed, very cool. And here the current production model. Now there is an iteration between these that's a little bit different. This one being the brand new sort of redesign. They made some minor design tweaks and I guess I wouldn't necessarily say minor um, in terms of the overall capabilities of the blade. The original even um, you know production model as well as this prototype being a convex edge. This one here being a, I'd call it a Scandi ground um, you know, a flat grind with a secondary bevel, which is a little more conducive to the general user and their ability to maintain the knife. Mm -hmm. yeah, first, uh, first view of the uh, Selkdom, and I got to tell you, it uh, feels great. It feels really robust. Ergos are there. Appearance is really sharp too. I like the hammered look. Oh, I always love the hammered look. That blacksmith hammered. Chimping is just right. Hand is uh, medium to large, and there's plenty of purchase here. Nice palm swell. Oh boy, this has got all the- Feels big, good, right? Feels really good. I like that palm swell, <laughs> fits your hands real feels nice. Feels really good. So with that, we're definitely gonna need a good knife. Now these are carbon steel. We need to be careful in the wet environment, just maintain them as we go. But other than that, I think we got a bunch of work to do. What do you say? Let's get working. Uh, hey, uh, Walter, it's your turn, buddy. Okay, my friend, concept number two, remember? Safety. Safety. When you ignite your fire, you take care of select a proper place and you focus on two main planes. 
So first plane is the ground. You see, this will be not a safe place because you can easily uh, extend the fire without any control and we don't, we don't want to cause any forest fire. So remember, safety when ignite, take care of the ground plane. And the second plane you need to, to focus when you are preparing for ignite your fire with, uh, in, a, in a safe way is the air, all right? If you look here, this place has not enough uh, space over my head to make your fire in a safe way. A lot of dead uh, material that can be burned and make a fire, an air fire, without any control. All right, Walter, so any good bushcraft or survivalist, out there enthusiast is always gonna put safety first. Um, in this particular scenario, we wanted to be sure that we picked an environment that was safe Number one, a little bit wind, wind coverage, shelter-esque. So what Eric and I chose was this nice uh, granite ledge. Okay, if the wind comes over us, we could duck down, which we plan on doing anyway. So you can really save a lot of, uh, uh, keep your internal body core warmer, which is having the ability to duck down and have some coverage here. It'd also be very simple if we were to take some down boughs and cover if we had to spend the night. So half your shelter is already built for you, thanks to nature. So talking about the horizontal plane for fire, so we want to make sure that we've got enough cleared out area here. So if winds were to pick up, let's say we were injured, we were down, we were less mobile, fire started taking off, not going to be an issue in this area. The snow, the wet, the damp, okay, and coverage from the rock and wind, that's going to help from any potential spreading. A big thing people never do, they never look up. Talk about the vertical plane, critical. So we picked this area as well, we've got a nice uh, not fully open, but I'm not concerned about that. We might get some drips on us. That's not a problem. But any threat of having dried uh, bough branches hanging low is really almost eliminated here. We've got a great open canopy for smoke um, ventilation. And, uh, and again, no chance for getting those boughs caught. So, um, yeah, so I picked this area. And so in terms of the idea that we may potentially use this as a shelter location, we also selected this particular spot right here to stage our fire. Gives us a couple of advantages. First is a nice flat spot, just happens to be a little bit of a shelf right here so we can get that nicely laid out. It also has this beautiful rock backdrop here which is going to do two things. One, it's going to help contain the fire, so for safety purposes, but it's also going to get warm and help radiate heat and reflect heat back towards us. So again, the idea being if we were to leverage this as a shelter and lay some boughs down here and actually create a shelter, we could have a nice warm fire beside the shelter to help radiate heat towards us, keep us warm in this cold environment. All right, Eric, Joe, our last fire philosophy concept was sustained, remember? So what do we need to get a sustainable fire? We need to find three stages of our fire. First one will be tinder, second one kindling, and the third one fuel. So guess what? We will be collecting all of those. Let's go.
nice and dry. Should be able to make a nice little nest out of some of this. So as we scout this area, if we were to stay here for a prolonged period of time, things that we're considering for sustainable fire, for example, we do have a lot of pretty good standing dead here. There's a bunch of it all over here. There's a lot of standing dead. You can see this one with the V at the top. That's a nice piece that would last you a while. And there's a bunch of this that we could go after. So not gonna go after it today because we don't need that kind of fuel. But just right around here, there's enough to last us a good long time. So here we are, we've got a nice deadfall pine. And if you do have the luxury of having two tools, um, we wanna try to capture these very valuable dried needles for ignition. So with the chopping of the ax, you're gonna find that you're gonna drop a lot of those needles and branches that we need, the small little tinder. So in this particular case, I'm gonna use my saw. Less vibration, I'm gonna keep a lot of that small tinder intact. this one stay it's too damp perfect Sometimes you may find a little bit of fat wood, not on this piece, but you never know. Figures. Without fail every time. Okay.
So I heard this a little while back. Uh, hairy, airy, and scary. Now we don't have a lot of hair on here, but we did gather some other dried leaves and things. So remember, it's gotta start small to take a spark and the fire has to start to grow. So this nice dry pine needles and branches is gonna help. You gotta be careful with stuff like this because it's already been, you know, contaminated by the snow and the slightest bit of moisture could throw everything off. But the stuff that we kept consciously off the ground is very dry. So I'm gonna put that actually to the side. Um, I think I'm okay with that small ignition pile, Eric. What do you think? And to Joe's point, any moisture can be a game changer. So you'll notice that when I started, I really started trying to pile everything kind of up leaning against this little branch that's holding everything up out of the snow. The last thing I wanted to do is put all my, you know, fuel and tinder kindling sources down on the snow. So here, just getting it upright kind of helps. And at least at this point, if there is any moisture, it's really only on the very ends of the logs. Okay, uh, here, I have different kind of tinder samples. But basically what they all have in common, they are really soft, soft material, something that ignites really quickly. That's the basic concept for tinder, right? Your tinder must be really soft. Otherwise, it will be really hard to ignite. Here, pine needles, really dry. You saw I collect those hanging from the tree. This, I got this from a palm. See, really soft. Also, this bird nest was made from a big, a big piece of palm, you see? I just smash it and twist it and make it really soft like this. Another good tinder resource is birch bark. It's really oily, okay? Yute and some other kind of uh, barks. And here, this is a path that's really easy to do with a cotton pad and you just uh, put this in a wax and it works really well, really well, okay? So remember, your tinder must be really soft, small, so ignite really quickly, right? As the main concept, your tinder should be never bigger than the point of a pencil, right? That's the top. No bigger than that. Really soft material. All right, so we gathered here a couple ignition sources and tinder. Got some birch bark. We have some pine branches that we processed down. Now I know a lot of this is large and we're gonna hope that the small stuff takes a spark. So we do have some commingling going on here. But I am going to try to actually pull out some of the needles, Eric, and see if I can get that to start. Yeah, one of Walter's philosophies on tinder sources is that it's smaller than the point on the tip of a pencil. Well, you can see here, a lot of this is bigger than that, but again, it's very dry. It's co-mingled with some of these needles, and we're hoping this is going to work. We were really hoping to find something like, say, for example, a nest or grasses. But bottom line is, this is just the wrong place, the wrong time, and the wrong environment for that. So again, trying to make do with the sources we have readily available. So here is one of our primary um, ignition sources and that's really nice dried birch bark. The oils stay in here for years. Uh, the wood itself could rot away completely. And I've seen round cores of birch bark, the rings, you pull them out, scrape off any of the rotted wood and break this up as best you can. And we're gonna do the best we can to see if we can get this to start. But this is really a critical component, I believe, Eric, on getting that secondary fire going. And another one of the philosophies that Walter discusses is tinder being soft. So again, we didn't have anything very soft. However, we did manage to find some very nice dry birch leaves. These are off the ground. They were completely dried out, nice and dead. We tested them to see if they would burn and they do very nicely. So these should make a nice ignition source and we can also use these for a nest if we need to. Now the other thing is, again, 
one of the philosophies is being prepared. And as we mentioned early on, we have plenty of synthetic materials in our fire kits to get us going if we need to. Now, by all means, we are going to try to avoid that. We would rather use the natural materials as that's really the best for this scenario. However, if we have to, we do have those synthetic sources as well. All right, fellows. After collecting and processing our wood, we have our three clear stages for fire. Here, our tinder with a nice burnness, really soft. Here, the kindling with intermediate size wood ready to ignite. And here, our fuel. From here, you can go, of course, to bigger pieces of wood once you have a sustainable fire. Now we are go for it. Processing your wood to make your fire. It will be your turn. Eric and Joe. Alright, got some nice good sized pieces here. We're gonna baton, that's pretty dense. Well, that could be a nice baton stick, but we gotta get these processed. We gotta get to the dry inner core. And this is always fun to me. We'll start with that. We'll get some shaves here. Here we are creating some tinder resource too. A feather stick. All those curls will help us to ignite our fire. Now your turn. We're going to get into some curls. The key to the curls, in my opinion, now that we've split the wood, is getting on the inside. You don't want to be making curls out of the outside wood. It's been a little damp. What's the purpose of that? So getting on the inside, that's going to be key. And here you'll see this is the Selknam prototype, which has a convex grind. The knife that Joe's using is the current production model, again being more of that saber grind with a flat grind and a secondary bevel. This is going to be a little more rounded out, so probably not quite as good for the carving tasks, but I'm going to give it a go here. Use Walter's prototype. And the key to this is always finding a nice line that you can run down. 
So it might take a little bit of processing to get started. Now if I was smart, I'd be planing this down onto something to catch these little curls. So what I'm gonna do is, even though it's not necessarily the best, I am going to potentially sacrifice my hat just a little bit. I'm gonna be careful not to go down and carve onto my hat, which sometimes you do bear down. I'm gonna catch my curls here, and that's gonna work out mighty nice. So you just gotta think sometimes a little smarter. We don't wanna let any of this work go to waste. And especially if this was truly a survival situation, every little calorie counts. So you don't wanna waste your time and do your work twice. But you can see here, this convex grind actually is doing a fairly nice job with the curls here. It's planing down beautifully. And as long as I take a nice controlled action here, you can see this will take a mighty nice little shaving. Very refined. It's doing a beautiful job and you can see the color of the wood there. It is nice and dry. So this is gonna catch very easy. The other thing is, and I gotta give Walter props, this handle is magnificent. It feels very good. It has a beautiful contour, and this is extremely comfortable in my hands. I could carve with this literally indefinitely, and I don't think I would fatigue or get tired. It feels very, very good. I think with that, we have enough at least to get started. And I'm gonna be very careful now with these curls to make sure that they don't get wet. So I'm gonna put these inside my dump pouch and I'll keep them nice and dry till we're ready to start the fire. Get all those shapes. The material will work very well as your tinder. Get all that. And save it for later. Now one of the things that Walter did was he took some of the shavings and he put them in a tin to make char cloth, char tinder. Um, he also had, I believe, uh, some segments of mushrooms, which I certainly don't have. Now, I do have a little hole in my tin. Now, a lot of times you will use like a cloth or something like that literally to make char cloth, but I'm gonna make some little sort of char tinder here. So taking some of the shavings that I just processed down and getting them in here, we're gonna give this a try. So once we get our fire lit, we're actually gonna make ourselves a nice little fire tinder. All right, Eric and Joe, what would you do if you don't have any easy tinder uh, available. You can produce, you can make, you build your own tinder. So I will use my Selden knife since it has a 90 degree spine but also has this, this scrapper. This is scrapper. I put this in the design to be very efficient when scrapping your ferro rod. I will use the same the same tool, the same notch, all right, to get really soft material. See?
All right, Eric, Joe, the time has come. So now we will ignite our fires, and I want you to try the same techniques I will use today. First one, we will use the ferro rod, and then we will use clean and steel. So let's do it. Okay, Eric and Joe, first technique. We'll use the ferro rod, right? I'm not trying to ignite yet. I'm just getting some shapes. Getting ready for to ignite my fire, right? Just that. Just getting some shapes. Okay, in my school, if you want to approve this test, you need to make this ignite your fire with the fair rod in no over than 60 seconds. All right, let's try it. No over than 60 seconds. Ready? Go. All right, there we go. See, our Tinder bundle working very well and we put the kindling and there we have a sustainable fire Okay, one of the nice things I'm noticing about this knife that Walter designed is we have some redundancy here, which is excellent. We have a very nice, sharp 90 degree spine used for scraping, ferro rod and or bark. You also have a built-in uh, striking notch, which I think is great. Some people don't want to uh, dull the spine out, but in case something were to happen, we have this as a backup or primary, whatever you're comfortable with. Bow drill divot, which is great. So in theory, we have one, two, three um, fire ignition uh, uh, options. But right now, I'm probably just gonna go with the with the spine, and we'll see if we can't get a spark out of this little fuzz that Eric made. Then I'm gonna grab some of this, bring it over here. Well, Joe, if you're gonna pass Walter's class, you only got 60 seconds.
Let it breathe. Okay, put that small can that you you can see there with some shapes inside, wooden shapes, also a piece of amadou and some a uh, piece of cloth also inside and I'm making some char cloth for the second technique. Alright, now it's time for this to cool off. Okay, we have our tar material. I will use the 1095 striker of my condor selenum knife to ignite with another technique and then will be your turn Eric and Joe okay here we go the 1095 striker there we go I'll put it in my tinder bundle here and I start blowing gently as you see I like to make circles so the amber gets bigger in all directions Once we have this really uh, clear white smoke, we are done. You see? All right, your turn. All right, so we got a reasonably sustained fire at this point. Feel pretty good about it. A little moisture, you can see the moisture coming off of the fire, but we do uh, at least have a good ember bed and we're starting to add some fuel. And so now that it's nice and sustained, I'm gonna get this little char tin in there. I'm going to slide it in, give it a little bit and hopefully get some little charcoals out of this. So I'm just going to make myself a little spot and we'll slide it down inside. Right in the middle and as I was mentioning with that bellows, I'm not going to need it right now but little oxygen can go a long way so I'll keep this thing nice and hot and as it continues to grow I'll get myself some char out of this see the flame just emanating from the little hole in the tin it's doing its job the hole allows the gases to escape yet at the same time there's not enough air to fully burn the wood, so it's doing its job. All right, so Joe, on the side of the sheath, you have a steel. So we actually, we do have a flint with us. Um, so Joe brought a flint, and here, right on the side of the Selknam sheath, comes with a steel. So here you have a 1095 striker. One thing we didn't mention, the Selknam is 1075, but I believe the striker here is 1095. 
So um, you have a piece of flint. Let's see what happens here. All right, we're gonna go another method here. Nice job. Oh. Well, Joe. Never easy as it, as it looks in the backyard, but. Well, I'll tell you what. You didn't quite get the uh, ferro rod going in 60 seconds, <laughs> but we got it. And now uh, we also nailed the uh, char cloth, so. Boom. Nice job. Thanks, buddy. Okay, dear friends, we are almost done. So now we'll be check our last concept. Remember, safety but safety when turning our fire off. We don't want to cause any forest fire. So let's go and see it. Okay, to turn off your, our fire in a safe way, we will observe four concepts that I developed. Okay, first one is to separate. We will separate what is there burning in order to diminish the temperature, one of the components of fire, all right? Then, we will suffocate, suffocate, taking all the air of the fire. Then make it wet. And the last step is to isolate. In this case, it is already isolated because here we are in a fire pit, okay? But on the other conditions, you need to be sure that nothing will be close enough to reignite your fire. Remember four steps. Separate, suffocate, make it wet, and isolate. All right, and so as Walter had mentioned, part of the safety aspect, one of his key three principles is the proper uh, extinguishing of the fire. So first thing he does is spread it out. So we're gonna kind of open the fire up here. We're gonna reduce the overall fuel source. We're gonna open this right up. Next we're gonna start to snuff everything out. So deprive it of oxygen. Continue to snuff everything as we see little flare-ups. Continue to spread this out and in order to fully extinguish now we need to add some water well we got plenty of snow here so you can see this will do a nice job no problem and you can see we started to develop some some good heat here all the snow banks are starting to melt back on us so this fire was really doing a good job starting to take off but at this point I'd say we fulfilled our mission. Walter, nice job, buddy. Great teaching, and I'm glad we were able to apply these principles in our backyard. All right, but how important is fire for survival? Fire is a great partner. Fire can be a tool. You can build things with fire. Uh, fire can be a weapon. You can protect yourself with fire. Of course, you can boil your water, cook your food. Fire makes people to get together. Everybody wants to be around a fire and talk and share. Fire is the best TV ever. So 
Yes, fire is an essential. You need to handle uh, fire well. You need to be able to create fire easily. It is an essential for survival. All right, so there you go, guys. That was our following of the teaching and training of Walter Matthews. Walter, thanks, man. Really appreciate that. Uh, I hope everybody watching enjoyed that. Uh, Joe, I would say we were pretty successful, man. Yeah, tons of fun. It's uh, really uh, great to, to work with uh, Walter. Thank you so much. And uh, really take those core principles and apply them to whatever environment you end up in. Yeah, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, that's the key is, and, you know, we obviously, as, you know, I'm not going to say, like, wilderness guys, but, you know, we spend a lot of time out here. I mean, we're not, you know, truly, like, you know, at the heart, like, woodsmen, but I think we enjoy this. We have some good principles. We've now taken some of the knowledge that, you know, we already had and enhanced it with just the core fundamentals. Sometimes when you get into this stuff, you just kind of go at it, and you don't, slow down to really think about those basic fundamentals and really at their sort of base level and that's the start of this when you talk about the five c's when you talk about combustion why are we doing what we're doing well it's because behind all of this there are core principles and values to follow and so today was you know really an opportunity to get out here in our environment and sort of strip it back and say, let's think about it from the basic fundamentals and not just go, you know, hog wild. And, and I think from that standpoint, we, we did a pretty good job. I enjoyed it. Yeah, Eric, you made a good point. It's uh, core principles. And these core principles have been proven with human beings since really the beginning of time. Uh, granted, we don't live outside every day. We're making a fire every day and gathering and hunting and, and trying to stay warm. But when we do go out in the bush, you have to take those core principles and, and first of all, readiness, prepare, have an abundance of, of sources, slow it down. No trip is ever perfect. And no matter whether it's backyard bushcraft practice or in the uh, deep Canadian rocky wilderness, you take those mistakes and you learn from them for the next time. And actually today, I learned some additional items and I thank you and I thank Walter and I had so much fun. This was great. You know, I wish we could stay out a little bit longer, but hey, you know what? We got this beautiful wilderness back here. What do you think? Want to go do some snowshoeing? Yeah, we got about 110 miles back to the uh, the cars, so we better get a head start. Let's do it. All right, my friends, Eric and Joe, and also our followers, we are done. We already review and try some techniques regarding one of the five C's. In this episode, we went through. Uh, combustion tool so be prepared for the next one and try what you saw in this episode just observe the safety uh, proceedings I show you right so see you in the next one